So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today is uh, auditory and vestibular system. So we are going to talk about the ear and mainly about the external and the middle ear. As you can see here, there are two uh, clinical terms used for that. In uh, Latin, it's a feminine term, auris. And in Greek, it's us. And the genitive is oton, and the term otology is derived from this Greek term. And you can see a section in the frontal plane through the external ear, middle, and internal ear here. And on the other side, you can see many ac acupuncture points on the auricle. This kind of therapy is called auricle therapy. And we have no uh, evidence based in Western medicine for this kind of treatment. So we won't talk anymore about the, this way of uh, treating and therapy. And we go back to uh, the classical anatomy and histology. So today we will concentrate on the oracle and external acoustic meters first and then middle ear cavity together with the eustachian or auditory tube and then basics about the inner ear and then the histology and embryology of the inner ear will follow in a separate uh, lecture by Dr. Uhlik. So let's start with the external ear. And the external ear consists of three structures. One is well visible and it's called auricle. The term auricle, auricula, is a diminutive of oris. Sometimes in English literature, the term pinna is used as well. Then this opening is external acoustic pore. And that's the uh, beginning of the external acoustic meatus. And the termination of this corridor is uh, fibrous, very thin tympanic membrane, which is simultaneously the lateral wall of the middle ear cavity. In clinics, the term myrinx is used, and myringitis is the inflammation of tympanic membrane. So what we can describe on the auricle? There are many structures uh, visible on the auricle, so now a bit of descriptive anatomy. So helix, meaning a spiral, yeah, is this structure. So it's the border of the auricle. So this structure we will call helix. And helix has got some smaller parts like auricle tubercle, which can be found here sometimes and a cruise, and a spine, and coda, yeah, which are smaller structures. And opposite prominence is called antihelix. Antihelix is this part, which is then divided into two crura, superior and inferior here, and they produce a triangular fossa in between these two crura. And between helix and anhelix is a long and quite narrow depression, which we call scaffa. Scaffa means a boat. So this should remind you of a boat in Venice in Italy, which is called gondol, very, very long and quite narrow boat. And the term boat is used in, from Greek term Kimbe, Simba, and that's this small part. Yeah, this is Simba, and next to it is a cavity, and the cavity all together forms a concha or concha. Yeah, and concha is this, and the shape of concha should remind you of a shape of a shell. Yeah, 
So this area should look as a, as a shell. And the cavity of concha is the entrance into external acoustic meatus. Okay, then we have two small tubercles. One is called tragus. And tragus comes from Greek term for a male goat. Uh, as it's quite large in goats. So this is tragus. And opposite, we find anti-tragus. Uh, that's this small area. We have tragus and anti-tragus. And in between, intertragic notch. And the notch is this one. Okay, the last is lobule, and lobule differs from the rest of the auricle as it is not formed by cartilage. So lobule is missing on this figure of the cartilage. The cartilage is elastic. Yeah? So this is the anterior surface and all the structures on the surface. Yeah? So here we have a photo of all the structures again. If you have questions to that, it's important that in the lobule, there is no, uh, no underlying cartilage. So that's the uh, most suitable area for piercing here. That's why earrings are put here. If you uh, pierce the auricle somewhere else, you can cause a destruction of the, of the cartilage. Yeah? So that's very important that this area is without, uh, uh, without the underlying cartilage. Uh, the auricle can be uh, in, uh, in a position which is called apostasis. And apostasis means that the ears are not uh, nicely adherent to the head, that they are in a different angle. And uh, some people consider it as a, not, not as a nice one, not as a nice situation. And they ask for operation. And during the operation, part of the cartilage is cut and then the angle of the auricle is, is changed and the auricle is then put uh, closer to, to the surface of the head. So that's, uh, that's the part, that's the surface and the cartilage. And then of course, it has to be fixed to the head. So it's fixed by ligaments and we have three ligaments and it's fixed by extrinsic muscles. And we have three auricular muscles. Yeah, you can see some of them cut here. And these small muscles and these ligaments, so altogether six structures, fix the auricle to the temporal parietal muscle, which is part of the epicranial muscle, and that's the way of the fixation. All of them are supplied by facial nerve, so they belong to facial or mimetic muscles. Then we have some other muscles which are located on the auricle itself. Yeah, like here and dorsally as well. We call them intrinsic muscles. They are rudimentary. So please do not learn their names as we are not able to move them much. Yeah? So they are of no clinical use. They just exist. They are very small. Forget them. You just should know that we have some intrinsic muscles innervated by facial nerve and they are rudimentary. That's all. As I said, the cartilage is elastic, so you can try to move your own auricle and you can see how it uh, uh, gets back into uh, the original position. And it's important that the skin is firmly attached ventrally and dorsally it is uh, more loosened. So you can try to make a small fold of the skin on the posterior surface of your own auricle but you are not able to do it on the 
uh, on the ventral surface or the lateral surface. Yeah, better call it. This is this is lateral surface. This is medial surface. So on the medial surface, uh, there's a subcutaneous tissue, so you can you can move the skin against the base, but not ventrally. And if there's a small inflammation or uh, bleeding then the inflammation is painful and the bleeding can uh, destroy the cartilage yeah so if there's a larger ot hematoma and bleeding we have to open it and evacuate the blood to prevent the destruction of the cartilage okay that's for the the structure and now supply if you uh, imagine where the auricle is situated, where it's located. It's on the temple, so it's applied by superficial temporal artery, and you can palpate this artery ventrally to the auricle. So it ascends here. Yeah. And another branch from external carotid artery is posterior auricular artery, which is located behind. Uh, the veins are homonymous and they drain into external uh, jugular and internal jugular vein. And the lymph nodes are located ventrally, parotid ones, and dorsally, mastoid ones. Yeah? So, most complicated is innervation. As you can see, the innervation comes from three sources. One source is cervical plexus and its great auricular nerve great auricular nerve has got anterior branch and a posterior branch so it's like a fork supplying the inferior part yeah ventrally and dorsal then occipital minor or lesser occipital nerve which goes this way so that's cervical plexus Superior and ventral or lateral aspect is supplied by um, auriculotemporal nerve, and auriculotemporal nerve runs together with the artery. Yeah, so it's a neurovascular bundle, the superficial temporal artery, and auriculotemporal nerve. And finally, the last one is. Uh, auricular branch of vagus nerve which goes through the bone through mastoid canaliculus and it uh, terminates at uh, tympanomastoid fissure and it supplies part of the concha and external acoustic meatus. So in case you would like to clean the ears and you use the ear sticks, you can irritate the nerve and you can cause irritation of the vagus nerve. So you can feel tickling on uh, in, in your throat, you can start to cough and your heart frequency can, can be lowered even, yeah. So it depends on the sensitivity to uh, uh, vagus nerve stimulation. So please take care when uh, cleaning the ears. And of course, the motor innervation, as we said, all the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles are supplied by facial nerve. Okay, any questions to Oracle? It's more descriptive anatomy. And please concentrate on the innervation of the Oracle, as it is not easy. Continuation is the external acoustic meatus. The external acoustic meatus is formed mainly by cartilage, which is elastic. Uh, maybe uh, you can find in, in some books uh, written hyalin, and it's, it's, it's a mistake which can, which can be present in some uh, books, textbooks. Yeah, it's the same cartilage as the uh, Auricular, auricular cartilage, so it's elastic, and it's this part. Then it's uh, narrowed, so we call it isthmus. Yeah? 
and then it's of course osseus and it's formed by tympanic part of the uh, right tympanic part of uh, the temporal bone yeah well here in the floor and ventrally can be a small slits these slits are called Santorini's incisors, yeah, Santorini notches, and through them, inflammation from external acoustic meatus can spread towards a temporomandibular joint. So it is important to know this, yeah. Uh, lamina tragi is part of the cartilage located ventrally, and I'll come back to another figure where it is nicely shown. The lamina tragi is shown here. Yeah, that's this part. That's, as I said, lamina tragi. Which you can uh, palpate as a structure underlying tragus. And of course, you can see here the uh, notches. Yeah, here are the notches. And the notches, yeah, we call the in incisors of some Torini. Yeah. As I said, through them, uh, the inflammation can spread ventrally and caudally to uh, the head of mandible and to the temporal mandibular joint. Okay, so back to this slide. Another important information is about uh, the direction of the external acoustic meatus. Yeah? So as you can read, it goes vent ventromedially, then it a bit turns and goes purely medially, and then again uh, turns and go again ventromedially. So it's a bit descending. And the two of them converge in an angle which is 160 degrees. Yeah. Oh, sorry. In your own head, like this. Yeah. If it's a bear's point of view, so you look from above in a transverse plane. They go like this, ventromedially. So if you would like to uh, look into the ear nicely to see the tympanic membrane in otoscopy, what do you do? You move, uh, you, you take the end of the ear, the tip, and you move it up and dorsally, yeah? up and dorsally, dorsocranially. So then you stretch it, you stretch this sloping and curved external acoustic meatus and you can better see inside. So please remember, you have to um, stretch the auricle dorso craniale, yeah, up and dorsally. Inside is of course skin and the skin has got some glands and there are sebaceous glands and apocrine ceruminous glands. Yeah, you will see then some histological slides of that. And uh, the secretion of both sebaceous and ceruminous glands forms a cerumen. And the cerumen uh, protects, uh, protects the, the skin against infection. The shape of the auricle and external acoustic meters is made not only to uh, get more um, wave length, uh, sorry, uh, more um, air waves inside, yeah, the sound waves going through the air, but also if you, if the wind goes in, uh, the shape allows all the, uh, all the dirt which can be in, in the air to get out. Yes, so the shape helps you to clean clean the ear. Otherwise, it would be stuck with, with dirt. 
the skin is again adhering uh, to what is deeper, so to perichondrium, as on the lateral surface of the auricle. The same is here inside the external acoustic meatus. And we have already talked to the relation to the temporomandibular joint and next to it is parotid gland, so the inflammation can also spread to the parotid gland or vice versa. Here we just have two uh, photographs of the Santorini who described the accessory pancreatic duct and who described the, the notches in the cartilage of external acoustic meatus. And then another guy, his name is Mr. Venus, and he, he described this nice uh, flower and a tympanic notch. And what is a tympanic notch? If we draw the external acoustic meatus, as the external acoustic meatus looks like this, so then at the end, If this would be an external acoustic pore and external acoustic meters, and the middle ear cavity is somewhere here, and the entrance into that is not quite round, but up is something which is called tympanic notch or in in Cisura tympanica of Rivinus. Yeah? And inside this notch, we will have a, a, a special part of, of tympanic membrane. So as for the blood supply, it's, as you can see, similar to uh, external ear to the auricle. And there's another small artery coming from the first part of the maxillary artery, which we call mandibular part, and it's a very thin artery, deep auricular artery. So there are three of them. The veins are similar, the lymph as well, and for the nerves, it's mainly auriculotemporal and auricular branch of vagus nerve, yes? So two nerves supplying the external acoustic meatus. So now let's talk about the tympanic membrane. As you can see, the tympanic membrane is uh, a round structure, which is located at the end of the external acoustic meatus. And you can see that it is not vertical, yeah, but it is sloped. Yeah? Here is an angle of some 40 to 50 degrees. And uh, this very thin, connective tissue plate is grown firmly with the handle of maleus. Handle or manubrium of maleus. So it's grown together. As you can see this tip, which records spatulate process, then retracts the center of uh, the tympanic membrane in. So it is not flat, it is concave, yeah? From externally, it is concave. So there's a depression. Well, the tympanic membrane is uh, located inside a groove. And this groove is in the bone. And the groove is called tympanic groove or sulcus tympanicus. Yeah, so it like it looks like that. This is the notch, and this is the groove. Yeah, and the membrane is in, and its margin it's thickened within the groove and this thickening is called fibrocartilaginous annulus. Yeah? So it's thickened, of course, it's thickened there because it's attached there. As you can see, it's like uh, one to one centimeter. So it's nearly perfect, uh, perfect circle, but it's very thin, yeah? only 100 uh, micrometers thick. And it's composed of three layers. 
as it is uh, formed by two different structures during development. Yeah. So this is endoderm. So this internal structure is called first endodermal pouch. And it then forms the tympanic cavity. And of course, auditory tube, yeah. And externally, it's ectoderm. So we call it first uh, ectodermal cleft or pharyngeal cleft. And here, pharyngeal pouch. And then the cleft produces uh, external acoustic meters. So the outer surface is ectoderm. It's just the uh, outer layer of the skin, so epidermis. The inner surface is endoderm and it's low cuboid simple epithelium. And in between is, of course, ectomesenchyme. Yeah, it's an ectomesenchyme, which means a mesenchyme of the head, uh, enriched by neural crest cells. So in between is the ectomesenchyme of the first and second pharyngeal arch. Yeah. That's why the tympanic membrane has got three layers and each from different source. But you will come to this again during the embryology in next lecture. So very important part of the external ear is what you can see on otoscopy view. What is otoscopy? Otoscopy is the basic examination uh, of the ear, as we have talked about uh, the ophthalmoscopy or fundoscopy in the eye, which should be performed by every general practitioner, is the same, should be performed for the ear and examination of the tympanic membrane. So you, you take an otoscope, you look in, and what you can see? You can nicely see a reflex of the light. Yeah, a reflex of the light comes from the part which is uh, in the best position against the light, which is shown there. This is ventrally and this is dorsally, yeah, cranially and caudally. And if we divide then uh, the tympanic membrane into quadrants or quarters, in the inferior anterior quarter, we find this reflex. So this is the first what you can see. You can see this, which is the fibrocartilaginous annulus, yeah, the thickening at the walls. And then you can see other structures. Okay. This one, which is in the center, and we call it umbo. Umbo comes from umbilicus, yeah? So it's in the middle. And if I draw here, a uh, hammer or maleu, maleus, yeah. The first uh, auditory ossicle, it looks like this. So at the end here, there's a process. It is called spatulate process, yeah. Spatula is a little spoon, spoon spatula, yeah. And this spatula produces the umbo. Yeah. Then is another structure. It's this one. Uh, on the bone, it is called uh, lateral process. And here it produces another prominence, which we call a prominence, malar prominence, yeah. In some books you can read maleolar 
but of course it's wrong as maleolus is a part of of the foot yeah maleus means hammer maleolus means little hammer diminutive but in the human body the hammer is very small one and it's the maleus and auditory ossicle ossicle maleolus which means linguistically little hammer is something bigger in the body and it's part of the tibula and fibula yeah so these are the maleoli so do not mix it and then what is bit in between is this such a bend or stripe so it's called stria malearis and it's elevated by the whole manubrium so the whole handle yeah so this is manubrium handle the head is located somewhere here so it's above the tympanic membrane and this is anterior process which goes into petrotympanic fissure and i hope you remember that fissure from the skull and we will come to the fissure again so there are some other structures visible two folds one fold here the other fold here yeah why are there the folds if you have some structure which projects here so you can imagine that it's it's a it's a linen and if you have a structure coming from below the linen up so that it makes such a folds or wrinkles so you can see these folds going to the side yeah so they are not underlaid by some structures they are like if you have a tent and the tent has got some some sticks going up so from the top of the stick the tent can form such folds but then we have this part between the folds yeah, here and this part is specific there's the part which is in the notch yeah, so the notch comes here There's the notch in Cisura Timpani, and the part is called flaxid part. Yeah, I will I will show you in a, in a minute the term again. So first, what you can see here, or I can write it here, so everything is is uh, in one slide. Flaxid part. Yeah, in Latin, pars flaxida, which means that it's it's not tense it's a loosened part and that we have the tense part as tensa which is the majority yeah? so the flexed part is in between in between the folds and the tense part is this yeah so this is called tense part and this here is called flaxid part and now you know all the structures which, which uh, are visible yeah the light reflex is sometimes called the triangle of the wild as the shape is triangular and there are other synonyms like cone of light or light reflex or polyterous luminous cone as th this was the the first uh, very nice uh, orientation structure uh, described during otoscopy so please learn to draw this figure as you can use it in your daily life of general practitioners so what you really can see uh, was described by Betzold and nicely visible is the prominence the stria and the reflex so the reflex the stria which is long and the prominence which is the most prominent structure so these three are called betzel strias and here we have the flaxid part again called sharpness membrane and the dense tense part which is the majority yeah so why you should know that if you see such a nice tympanic membrane it's healthy but if you have problems you have to treat it 
in case there's an inflammation inside, the inflammation can bulge uh, the tympanic membrane out and it can rupture. To prevent the rupture, you have two possibilities. First is to apply antibiotics early. Then the inflammation is stopped and nothing happens. But if it's too late, you have to perform a puncture. Where the puncture is performed, of course, caudale, because you can see that all three ossicles are located cranial. So you have to perform it caudally, and we perform it here. If you say this is ventral and this is dorsal, and we perform it in the lower posterior quadrant here. Not in the ventral quadrant, as this nice light of cone is a good orientation point, so we do not destroy it. Yeah, so not here. And of course not here, because in this area uh, there are located bones behind the tympanic membrane. So in the lower posterior quadrant. And it's called paracentesis, yeah, the puncture. So if you have a kid with the otitis media, with the inflammation, the kid has a, a fever and a pain in the ear and it's, it's screaming, so you come. Uh, to the physician, the physician will look there, will puncture it, the kid will scream very much in some few seconds because it's painful, but then the relief will come, yeah, as it can be trained. We have here two terms, declination and inclination, as we said, and what is also visible in here, that the tympanic membrane is not in vertical plane, but it's, uh, inclined yeah? and it's inclined in two uh, planes so it's inclined uh, ventrally and it's inclined laterally so in a sagittal and in a transverse plane and it's inclined in 45 to 50 degrees yeah so please remember that that it is not really vertical it is not a perpendicular structure but it's inclined in two planes Okay, question to this, which I consider the most important information for future physicians about the tympanic membrane. Okay, if you have no question about that, you can go on. Here are just two guys to show you. The Petzold who described uh, during the examination and I'll come I'll come back here. He described three structures, reflex, stria, and prominence, which are the most striking uh, structures. Yeah, that's Betzold. And why did he describe the uh, uh, light reflex? And what is interesting, he was son of Oscar Wilde. Even Oscar Wilde uh, was homosexual. He's got a son. Hi, there's a question. Is the position of the membrane, the degrees have a clinical importance? Yes, if you operate in, uh, you have to know that uh, the external acoustic meatus is not of the same length uh, cranially and caudally. Yeah, you can see the difference. And the same, it is not uh, ventrally and dorsally. Yeah? So in both planes, it is longer, as you can see, caudally and dorsally. So that's why it's important in clinics, the length. And the length is done by, uh, by the angle, and the angle is uh, half 90 degrees, so some 45 degrees. Okay, so on the left side is what you can see. On the right side is if you cut the tympanic membrane, what is behind the tympanic membrane. So during the operation, if you need to uh, open it, then you need to close it, uh, which we call a meringoplasty. And what we can see is the part of the malleus, yeah, mainly the manubrium, the handle, then the long cruise of incus, 
uh, here is a stapes behind yeah this and then some other structures and you already know them that's the stapedius muscle yeah, and we will talk about them in detail and the tensor tympani muscle and an nerve tympanic cord corda tympani yeah so these are the most striking structures inside the tympanic cavity so now it's time to move inside the tympanic cavity ah sorry i skipped the blood supply the blood supply comes for outer and inner surface from different sources for outer it's the first or mandibular part of maxillary artery giving the deep auricular artery and from the inner surface there are four tympanic arteries as you can see lymph is the same and innervation from outside we have talked about that and from inside it's missing here and from inside so inner surface it's innervated by glossopharyngeal nerve and its branch which is called tympanic nerve yeah i hope you remember this tympanic nerve which comes through uh tympanic annulus from below and i will show you in next figures so please do not forget uh this innervation of the inner surface of the tympanic membrane and now uh, middle ear and in middle ear we will talk about the cavity filled with the bones muscles ligaments and ventilated by auditory tube yeah well just to imagine how this area is small so this area is like uh, uh, our glass uh, structure yeah and it's as you can see a bit moved so it is a bit flipped this way so we could say it is in some uh, schemes it is drawn like a cube yeah this cube is only an imagination for you to make it easier as you can see it is not a cube it has got it is a rectangular one with longer vertical axis and it's narrowed here and how narrow is it between the tympanic membrane and then the inner ear which is here it's two millimeters only here six millimeters up here four millimeters down here so it's a very very narrow area so during the operation you need microscope and you need to work very carefully here yes there's a question can water go through the tympanic membrane after swimming in healthy of course not because there is no no communication so what about the walls as i said we can imagine it as a cube so now th think that this is a box and we look from above yeah so we are like a fly coming up and sit on the top of the box if we open the box we still look into the box like this so we can see an open box from above yeah you open the box what is the top of the box the top of the box is tympanic membrane yeah now we change uh the position of the box we are here and the tympanic membrane which is here is the top of the box here so what we did now we look into the box from the side so you take the box and you just move it 90 degrees to the side yes so the box will be here behind the box is here that's the box 
So the floor of the box will be this. And behind this inner ear. So inner ear is here behind. So you are looking into the box this way. We cut the top, the tympanic membrane. Yeah. So we look here. Yeah. You understand this this view and this this imagination. And we have the box here. This is the floor of the box and behind is inner ear. To get there, we have fenestra vestibuli and fenestra cochlea. And behind is cochlea. So this is the first turn of cochlea covered by bone. Yeah. And the tympanic membrane is attached, is attached to the box here. So we are looking into our uh, right ear, yeah? and this is ventrally, and this is dorsally. As you can see, the mastoid process here, dorsally, and a styloid process here. And uh, internal carotid artery here, ventrally. And what is up? Here is the brain temporal lobe. So I hope you understand this. So I'll come back to the walls. So the lateral wall is tympanic membrane. And that is what we have talked about before. That's the view you should know. The internal wall is called labyrinthine wall. And what is behind this labyrinthine wall? Inner ear. And it contains the promontory and the two windows, round and oval. The posterior wall is called mastoid because it's above the mastoid process. The anterior wall is called carotid, as in front of it is internal carotid artery inside the canal. The roof is called tegmental, as tegman means a roof, and you know it from a tegmentum in brain, for example. And the inferior wall is called jugular, because below we find a bulb of the internal jugular vein. On the inferior wall, there are two structures. Styloid prominence, yeah. we just move here. The styloid prominence would be somewhere here, above the styloid process. And the other structure is here. Tympanic canaliculus coming from Fossula petrosa. So, tympanic aperture of the canali tympanic canaliculus. Now, why you should know these structures? So, if you come to ENT, you will talk about the middle ear cavity, uh, its uh, disorders, pathologies, and how to treat them. And we treat them in a surgery way, so you need to know what is in if you look into the microscope. If you look into the microscope, you can see the structures which fill it, as I showed you, muscles, bones, ligaments, nerves, and then you need to know the walls. And the walls contain bulgings and depressions, yeah? So positive and negative structures. So you should know which bulging is which, so that's why you should know about styloid prominence, for example, that's a bulging down. And then you should know about the structures which emerge from openings. And these openings are called tympanic apertures of some canals or canaliculi. And you should know which canaliculus transmit what, and if there's a possibility of bleeding or cutting a nerve. And the bulgings, like the prominence, they can have the wall very thin and even not ocelles, so only membrana cells. So what can happen that uh, with the instrument, if you touch the wall and you press, you can get through this membranous wall and you can harm the structure. Yeah? 
and it's especially important in carotid artery, jugular vein, and facial nerve, as you can then cause terrible bleeding, and uh, a whole middle ear cavity, which is small, is then filled with blood, and you are not able to stop it, or you can cause a, a paralysis of the facial nerve. Yeah, that's why we go through all these structures in detail, even you would think, yeah, they are too small and they are too many. They are very important during the operations and in ENT you have to know them. And as there is many of them, the basic ones you have to learn now, then to be oriented if you come to ENT. Yes? Okay. So let's start with the labyrinthine, the medial wall. So what you can see here uh, is, is a view from lateral to medial. Yeah, so these sections are in a sagittal plane and these sections are a bit moved to each other. Yeah, so the upper section is more lateral, the section below is more medial. So what we can see? You can see this big bulging. This big bulging is done by first turn of cochlea. Yeah? Cochlea is a snail-shaped snail snail bony structure in the inner ear. And inside the cochlea, we have a, a sense of hearing organ, which is called cortispiral organ. And the basal turn of it bulges laterally into the middle ear cavity and forms this promontory. Yeah, so that's a promontory. So we have two promontories, one is in the pelvis, the other is here. On the promontory, we have a groove. Here is the groove. The groove is uh, for tympanic plexus. What is a tympanic plexus? Okay, we have already talked about uh, this tympanic canaliculus yeah, in the jugular uh, wall. What is inside is the tympanic nerve, which is branch of glossopharyngeal. As I said, it also supplies, it also supplies the tympanic membrane from, uh, uh, from internal aspect, yeah? so the inner surface of the tympanic membrane. It's a somatosensory nerve. But then it continues here up, ramifies, and receives these carotico-tympanic nerves. These carotico-tympanic nerves are sympathetic. They come from sympathetic internal carotid plexus. I hope you know that there's a sympathetic carotid plexus around each artery. So there's a plexus here. And the plexus for uh, dilation or constriction on the vessels also gives branches here. And then from here, it continues up as a lesser petrosal nerve. And lesser petrosal nerve supplies parotid gland and buccal glands. It's synapsed in otiganglion. So the tympanic nerve is not only somatosensory for the middle ear cavity, but also parasympathetic, visceral motor parasympathetic for parotid gland and buccal gland. Yeah? So now you understand tympanic plexus, and we can come back to other structures. The other structures are connected with the internal ear, and it's the oval window, or called fenestra vestibuli, as it opens into vestibulum, which is vestibule, which is part of the inner ear, and fenestra cochle, the round window, yeah, which opens into bony cochlea. These two openings are, of course, closed. And the round window is closed with a small membrane. This is called secondary tympanic membrane. The upper window 
the oval one is closed with stapes. Yeah. So the stapes looks like this. It's called in English stir up, and it should remind you of a stir up for the boot of a of a rider on a horseback. Yeah, if you ride the horseback, you have the saddle, and from the saddle down hang uh, two stirrups. So you put the the tip of the boot into into the stirrup. Yeah, so the stirrup has a base, and the base the base is fixed into the oval window, and it's kept there by a structure which is called ligamentum annulare tapediale, yeah? annular stapedial ligament. And this annular stapedial ligament is very important as it keeps, keeps uh, the base of the stapes in the oval window and it prevents the leakage of the fluid which is there, firstly. The fluid is called perilymph. And secondly, if you move the bones, then it starts to move the perilymph. And then the mechanical waves can continue uh, as far as the corticosteroid organs to uh, cause the movements of the uh, hairs of the hair cells. Yeah? So it's important for hearing. Okay, questions to these three structures? Okay, if not, let's go on. So there's a labyrinthine wall. Posterior wall, mastoid wall, most complicated. So you can see the mastoid process here. Yeah? So it's a wall which is above the mastoid process. What is there? Uh, the first structure is an opening of the cavity. So this is a cavity and it's so-called tympanic cavity proper. Yeah, in Latin, cavitas tympani propria. Yeah, tympanic cavity proper. And this tympanic cavity proper has got several uh, pouchings, which we call cells. Uh, uh, so some of the cells you can see here, some of them are here. There are many uh, parts of these cells. They are similar like the paranasal sinuses. So in elephant, they make your skull lighter. In humans, they help to ventilate the whole area. And of course, they can be filled with the fluid, they can be inflamed and they have to be cleaned. So we have uh, groups of them and uh, the name of the groups and their locations are important for the surgeons. You will just learn some of them and uh, some of them means that we have uh, so-called antrum, which is the largest one. Antrum means a corridor. So this is the antrum. And then the antrum has got some, some other uh, smaller pouches, which we just call cells, yeah? mastoid cells. So the top of the posterior wall contains an opening, which is called aditus entrance. Aditus antimastoidi entrance into mastoid antrum. Mastoid antrum is like a like an atrium or vestibule uh, in a. So you can imagine this as as a theater that you have the door into the theater, which is called aditus. Then you have uh, the big hall in the theater, which is called antrum, and then you have a small doors into the small. Uh, parts uh, where are the chairs so you can you can watch the, the spectacle yeah and these are called mastoid cells yeah mastoid air cells yeah all of these of course contain air so they are called air cells 
So the proper anatomical term is mastoid cells, but they all uh, are air cells. Huh? And in uh, the aditus, if you look into the uh, antrum, you can see two bulgings. One of the bulging or uh, prominences in, in uh, proper language. One of the bulgings is done by facial nerve kennel. And the facial nerve kennel we have already talked about. It's got three parts. Goes like this. This is the first labyrinthine above the uh, inner ear. This is the second tympanic above the middle ear. And this is the third mastoid in the, or behind the mastoid wall of the tympanic cavity. Yeah. So then this structure is then called, oh, sorry, different color. This structure is then called the prominence of uh, facial canal. Yeah, in Latin, prominencia canalis nervi facialis. So this area, approximately. And just above it is another bulging, another prominence, and it's the prominence of lateral semicircular canal, part of the inner ear. So imagine that the bony wall is not here. There's an only membranous wall. You have inflammation inside. What can happen? The inflammation can cause paralysis of the facial nerve. It can cause irritation of lateral semicircular canal. Please give me the answer into the chat. What will happen if we irritate the lateral semicircular canal of the inner ear? What do you think? You should know the answer. Even we have not talked about, about this in detail. Any idea what would happen if we irritate this area? Or if during surgery you would break into the, into the structure there? If you break into the structure, then the fluid can get out, yeah, the perlymph. It has to do with balance, perfect. So you will lose the balance. So you will have vertigo, yeah? Vertigo is the answer. Problem with the balance, perfect. So we can move. And now below we find some smaller structures. One of them is pyramidal eminence. And pyramidal eminence, that's a, that's a cone a hollow cone, yeah, it looks like a volcano. And inside this hollow cone, we have the belly of the staperius muscle and the tendon of the staperius muscle then goes up, uh, not up, out, sorry, out, and is attached to the neck of stapes. Yeah. So majority of the muscle is hidden inside this pyramidal eminence. And here we can see the cut of pyramidal eminence. Yeah, you can see the hollow cone here. Okay, another structure is uh, tympanic cord canaliculus. So you know that the tympanic cord passes through the cavity like that. That's why it's called a cord. Uh, this cord is, uh, of course, not as a rope, but it is hidden in a membranous, a mucose fold, sorry. All the structures, of course, in the middle ear cavity are not standing themselves. They are covered with mucosa. Yeah? So you can imagine that there are many folds coming from the roof and enveloping all the structures. And one of them envelopes the tympanic cord. So on the section, then it looks like this. Yeah? It's something like mesentery. You have the tympanic cord here, and there's a fold, mucous fold. Yeah? And the fold continues then on the bones. So you have then the bones, the malleus, and the incus here. And they are, of course, covered by the mucosa as well. Yeah, all the structures have to be covered with mucosa. So the tympanic, uh, 
to the uh, corda tympani as it runs here. It has got its anterior and posterior canaliculus. Anterior is here and posterior is here. Yeah, somewhere here. And you know it's a branch from the facial nerve. So tympanic aperture is just the opening of the posterior canaliculus of the, of the corda tympani. Tympanic sinus is a depression. We have to talk about the bulging, which is the pyramidal eminence promontory, and between the bulging, there has to be depressions. There are more of them, and the largest, uh, with the easiest name, is tympanic sinus. Another interesting structure is uh, fossa incudis for the anvil, yeah, for incus, where the ligamentum is attached. So when I come to uh, this scheme which we had before. So now we have the posterior wall and you can see the aditus. Yeah? And in the aditus you can see two prominences, the prominences of the facial canal and prominence of the lateral semicircular canal. You can see the hollow cone of pyramidal eminence with tapedial muscle. We can see the tympanic aperture of the uh, cana posterior canaliculus of tympanic cord. We can see, for example, the fossa of incus, fossa incudis, for insertion of posterior ligaments. So, so this is the posterior wall, yeah, the most complicated one. So. Now the anterior wall. What is in the anterior wall? In the anterior wall we have the tympanic aperture of the anterior canaliculus of corda tympani. Yeah? It is not well visible in these sections, it's somewhere here. And it is part, or of course would be smaller. And it opens into another structure, which is called, and I draw it here only as a scheme. It is not located uh, precisely in this position. Yeah? And it then opens into a slit or a fissure, petrotympanic fissure. And through this fissure runs another structure in. Yeah? So it's not only the tympanic cord like that, it's another structure, and it's called anterior malar ligament, anterior malar ligament, and it's attached to spine of sphenoidal bone, spinosis is sphenoidalis. You may remember this structure from the scalp. So this ligament passes through the fissure. And during uh, fetal period and early childhood, the fissure is opened and the ligament can a bit move, but then it, it, it's closed, ossified, and the ligament is like spread into two parts, the extra tympanic and the intra tympanic part. Yeah? So the petrotympanic fissure, it transmits uh, the, uh, the corda tympani, the anterior malar ligament, and of course vessels, and we come to vessels later. So these are two smaller structures which are usually not drawn in any figure as, as they open into a, such, a, such an angle and it is not well visible in the figures. Another opening which is not well visible in the figures but it's located somewhere here uh, are the openings for the carotico-tympanic nerves and arteries, so the carotico-tympanic canalic line. And of course, the most striking part of the anterior wall is the musculotubal canal. Musculotubal canal, musculotubal in English, tubal, uh, consists of upper part for tensor tympani muscle. The tensor tympani muscle then hooks around a structure which is here, it's a very small one but it has got a shape of a snail. That's why it's called cochleariform process. It has nothing common with the cochlea of the inner ear. Yeah? 
Nothing common with that. It is just a shape which is similar to that. So please, this, this is a small process which serves just for the muscle which turns here and changes the direction as I will show you in some of the other figures. Yeah. So it just as a as a hook, and maybe hook would be a better term, but it is called cochlariform process. And then a smaller empty air filled auditory tube. So a semicolon for the auditory tube. And the very last structure is just at the at the top. So between the border uh, or at the border of the tegmental upper wall and carotid anterior wall and its opening of the lesser petrosal nerve. So apertura tympanica, tympanic aperture of the lesser petrosal nerve cannot. So we have talked about all the walls now. Questions to the walls. And now all uh, the structures uh, which are hollow, they contain some contents, of course. And if you look at the arteries now, so the arteries come from uh, five different directions, from above, superior, from below, inferior, from posterior, and from, from anterior. So they, these four are called tympanic arteries. And you just have to pay attention from which vessels they branch. The inferior branch from ascending pharyngeal artery. The ascending pharyngeal artery has got another branch and it's the posterior meningeal artery. Yeah, so posterior meningeal artery into the jugular foramen. And the other terminal branch is the inferior tympanic. The posterior branch comes from stylomastoid, which is a branch from posterior auricular. Yeah. So all these, you know, you just have to now put the information together. You just have to synthesize. The anterior tympanic is a branch uh, from the maxillary artery, from uh, the pars mandibularis, so the first part. Yeah the first part. And this also gives artery to what we have talked about, external acoustic meatus and tympanic membrane, and we call it deep auricular artery. Yeah, deep auricular artery. And these two are the smaller branches. The larger branches of this part are middle meningeal and inferior alveolar. And the middle meningeal is here. It enters the cranial cavity through foramen spinosum and gives some branches like the anterior tympanic or so called Petro's branch. And Petro's branch goes where? Into canaliculus, which is a friend of this one. And it's the canaliculus of greater. Petrosal nerve. Yeah. Okay. The last artery, the fifth one, is a group of these corticotympanic branches. The thinnest one, they just branch directly from from uh, internal carotid artery. The veins are homonymous, yeah, and they drain into, into the corresponding veins. The only veins which are special can go here up through this opening into the, uh, within the roof. The roof is called tegmen. The openings are innominate, the veins are innominate, and they drain into the sinuses, which are uh, close to the, to the top of the pyramid. So uh, now we get here to superior petrosal sinus, which is running at the superior margin of the petros part of the temporal bone. Yeah? There's a question. What are the functions of the mastoid cells for ears, for hearing? 
No, they are just for ventilation. Yeah, they, if, if they are not there, nothing happens. It's just a remnant from, uh, from uh, animals, yeah, just the pneumatization of the head to make it uh, lighter. There's no function for hearing. Okay, so any questions to not for echoing? Um, no, there is no echo there. We don't need any echo inside the middle ear cavity as uh, if it, if you uh, imagine, okay, uh, I can now skip to, to explain it. Uh, I can uh, share a whiteboard. And if we talk about uh, the way of hearing, we have some, uh, uh, if, if I draw it, we have the oracle, uh, like that external acoustic meters, then we have the tympanic membrane, then we have the bones. Okay, the tympanic membrane is different, yeah. And we have bones, so uh, the malleus, and then the incus, and then the stapes. There's the annular stapedial ligament around the base of the stapes. And then, so this is the middle ear cavity. Oh, sorry. The middle ear cavity with the oval window and the round window. And yeah, this is. Uh, the Eustachian tube here and nasopharynx, and external acoustic meters, and then we have uh, here the vestibule, and from the vestibule we have the cochlea. This is just just the scheme to make it nice, yeah. And then, then of course the uh, another three semicircular canals. So that would be the cochlea, and yeah, it's opened like like that. So what happens if we here we have uh, sound waves, yeah, which is a uh, mechanical mechanical waves. The waves come here, and they like knock on the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane start to moves, and it changes this uh, air waves changes into the mechanical waves of this bone system. And this bone system then uh, transmitted to a fluid, and the fluid is here. The fluid is perilymph, and the perilymph starts to uh, starts to move endolymph, which is here, and we will talk about this in detail then. And then it starts to uh, move the hair cells and produce the impulse. Yeah. So you need air. You need here the solid tissue and then you need fluid. So you can see that the mechanical waves go through the air, uh, uh, solid tissue and the fluid, and any echoes would uh, uh, be not useful here. The only useful thing is that the, the waves go here and go out, as here is a membrane secondary tympanic membrane in the round window and then the waves get out here so there is not uh, coming of the waves back and and 
interfering with the other comings. Yeah, that's not here. Does the fluid and the air cells play a role in balance? The fluid, yes, as the fluid is here. And you need the fluid for, for balance. But for balance, you need another fluid. You need this fluid. You need the endolymph. Yeah, the endolymph is good for balance. The air has nothing uh, to do with the balance, only the fluid inside the endolymph. Yeah? But you move the endolymph with moving your head. Not You are not moving that uh, with the mechanical waves coming from the uh, external and middle ear. How does the inner and middle ear deal with the very loud or high pitch sounds? Uh, they do not deal with it, just the brain has to deal with that. Yeah, and uh, it is via a reflex, and the reflex come to two muscles, which are here. One of the muscle is tensor tympani in here, and the other is here. So the tensor tympani makes the tympanic membrane tighter. So this is the tensor, yeah. And the stapedius keeps the stapes uh, more firmly in the oval window. Yeah, so these two muscles using reflexes, they uh, reduce uh, the intensity of the uh, waves which are transmitted. Yeah, but if it's too intense, it can of course destroy the hair cells. Yeah, so you understand now how you, how you hear? Okay, perfect. So I can, I can get back to the presentation. And uh, any questions uh, about the walls? If we come to further details, this, this is the view of the labyrinthine wall again. Yeah, I'll just explain it. This is ventrally, and this is dorsally. That's a promontory. Yeah. Uh, here is a round window with the secondary tympanic membrane. This is the base of the stapes in oval window. Yeah, you can see the head of the stapes here. And uh, this is styloid prominence. And there are some other structures, yeah, like anterior and posterior postis, a subiculum here, a ponticulus here and a finiculus here, and a fustis here. Oh, this is important for ENT surgery. Yeah? And you do not learn it, these smaller structures. Okay? We are just talking about the larger structures. So this is just to show you that it is not so, so easy then, and the anatomy is very complicated. Yeah? This is another view, as you can see it uh, here. And again, the promontory, with the oval window and the round window would be somewhere here. Pyramidal eminence here. Yeah, and then you can see the other structures, which are, uh, which are then the details important for the surgery. As you can see, the name structures are the positives, the bulgings, and in between are some of the sinuses so this is the tympanic sinus yeah the largest but then we have another sinuses all the way here with different names yeah and openings into other air cells so this is just to show you that uh, what we are going to learn or what you are going to learn is basic anatomy not detailed anatomy okay so the blood supply as i said Four tympanic arteries plus carotico-tympanic arteries, the drainage, homonymous tympanic veins going into pterygoid plexus, and we, which is uh, in the infratemporal fossa, and to superior petrosal sinus, yeah, through the tegmental wall. The lymph, similar to external ear, so mastoid and 
parotid lymph nodes plus the deep ones which go along uh, inferior tympanic vessels which comes from the ascending pharyngeal artery yeah so we get into uh, the parapharyngeal space so it goes into the deep cervical lymph nodes and even to retropharyngeal lymph nodes and you may remember we have learned a lymph node of Rouvier, yeah, which is the retropharyngeal lymph node behind the posterior wall of pharynx so in case we have a middle ear uh, cavity inflammation so otitis media or mesotitis we can have an enlarged we can have not in all cases we can have an enlarged lymph node visible uh, behind the posterior wall of the pharynx as a bulging on this wall yeah so please remember that for the uh, middle ear cavity we have the lymph drainage also deep uh, into uh, this spaces so into deep uh, cervical and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. As for the innervation, just to repeat, we have the tympanic nerve, which is somatosensory and parasympathetic. We have the sympathetic carotympanic nerve, and for auditory tube, and it's it's. Uh, pharyngeal part of the part close to pharynx it is innervated by the maxillary nerve and a very thin pharyngeal branch which comes through the palatovaginal canal okay i think now it's time to make a break and then we will continue with the uh, bones ligaments muscles tympanic tube and then uh, a basic information about the inner ear so let's talk about the ossicles or just to summarize information about the ossicles because everything has been already uh, said so we have the maleus as the first one and it has got parts and i will show the parts here so we have the head and a neck and a manubrium yeah so these are the basic parts. The manubrium is grown together with the tympanic membrane firmly. So it's a syndesmosis. Then we have some smaller parts. Spatuliform process, yeah, the spoon-like or little spoon-like, which is the very, very end here. And it then causes on the tympanic membrane yumbo. Yeah? The manubrium or the handle causes tria and another lateral process which is here or here then it causes the prominence and the last structure is the anterior process which is this one yeah and the anterior process goes into petrotympanic fissure with the ligament which then continues from that and it's the anterior malar ligament called as the process so that's that's maleus the other one is called anvil or incus and it has got a body which is this one with the articular surface for malleus and then there are two uh, two limbs a short limb which is thick yeah, and a long limb which is thin and at the end is another small process similar to a small lens so lenticular process yeah and the lenticular process has got articular surface for for the head of stapes yeah so we come to stapes to stir up 
and the stir up has got a head, a very small neck, and to the neck, a muscle is attached, and that's the uh, staperius muscle. And there's an anterior and posterior cruise and the base. Yeah. So the base is this. And the base sits in the oval window. Or fenestra vestibuli. And I forget about another muscle. And we can draw the muscles here. So here is attached the stapedius muscle. And here to the handle is attached tensor tympani muscle. Yeah. And the manubrium, as I said, is grown together with the tympanic membrane. Okay, and now we can see here joints. There are two joints in Kudo. Malear and incudostapedial joints, and of course, two syndesmoses, tympanostapedial syndesmoses, and tympanomalear syndesmoses. Yeah? So here is tympanomalear and tympanostapedial. And these syndesmoses and, and joints or synarthrosis, they allow the transmission of the mechanical waves yeah? from the tympanic membrane to. Uh, perilymph of the inner ear. We have talked about a ligament, which is here. And as I said, the ligament is very important, and we call it ligament annular staperiale. And this ligament fixates the base of the stapes into. Uh, the oval window, yeah, this we know. And in front and behind, oh, sorry, different color. In front and behind are two small fissures which ossifies later, yeah, during uh, pubescency and even adulthood. And these fissures, they are called ante. Fenestram and post fenestram fissures. Yeah, it is not important to know their names, I think, but it is necessary to know that the ossification can skip to this ligament. So the ligament can be ossified and then the transmission is not allowed anymore. So what happens? A deafness. Yeah, and the most common cause of deafness in adulthood is the ossification of the annular stapedial ligament, which then causes orthosclerosis, orthosclerosis. What do we do? We just take it away, yeah? The whole uh, stapes we take away together with this and we put there a prosthesis and artificial stapes. Okay, that's for the joints and bones. Now ligaments. So we have already talked about the annular stapedia ligament, yeah, which is this one. And if it's ossified, it causes autosclerosis. Then we have some superior ligaments here, yeah, for the malleus and incus. This is the superior ligaments. Then we have here the posterior ligament, which goes into fossa in kudis. Yeah, this is the posterior ligament. And then we have uh, anterior ligament, which is not visible. Ah, it's visible here. So we have the anterior ligament, uh, sorry, the lateral ligament here. And what is not visible is the anterior ligament. And we know that the anterior ligament goes through a petrotympanic fissure, so fissura petrotympanica, and is inserted onto the spine of sphenoid bone.
then another two structures stapedial membrane is this one between the limbs of the stapes and of course secondary tympanic membrane which is not visible here and it closes the round window so these are the membranes and ligaments here just a list to not to skip any of them and then two muscles so just to show them we have uh, here the tensor tympani muscle and of course the structure here is the cochlariform process yeah? so very small hook uh, along which uh, the tendon makes such an rectangular angle and it's attached to the handle of malleus yeah uh, the innervation is trigeminal nerve and the other muscle stapedius it's hidden here uh, within the pyramidal eminence and you can see only the tendon attached to the column of the stapes here it's innervated by facial nerve there's a question what the what was the ligament below lateral ligament of malleus? Uh, it was not below. If you mean this, this is the tendon of tensor tympani muscle. Uh, here we can see the tympanic cord. And of course, what is drawn here are the mucosal folds. Yeah, so you can see the mucosal folds here. So this is a mucosal fold which covers the bones and the tympanic cord as well. So was it the answer to your question, Diana? So when we come to uh, the airy areas, uh, sorry, we could not see the anterior ligament. No, we could not see it in this in this view. Yeah, it is not visible. It is hidden behind the bones. So now the airy areas or the the whole uh, cavity here. As I said, we have many air cells and. The area here is the tympanic cavity proper. Yeah, that's the tympanic cavity proper. It has got some subparts, like this is the epitympanic part or epitympanic recess. This is the hypotympanic recess. And uh, what else? The largest cell is mastoid antrum, yeah, and the mastoid antrum then opens into smaller mastoid cells, which are here, and then we have other cells, yeah, and the other cells we just can cover in the term of accessory air cells. Uh, and then you can meet the term uh, protympanum and protympanum is, is another synonym to here or here to uh, auditory cube mainly to the osseous part of the auditory cube yeah so these are all the ventilated spaces here so then we have to talk about the auditory cube this is a view from a medial to lateral. So what you can see is the tympanic membrane, a nicely visible corda tympani, and the tendon of tensor tympani here. Yeah, and the ligaments, the superior ligament of malleus of incus, the posterior ligament of incus, the anterior ligament would go this way out. That's it on this figure. 
So, to conclude the information about the cavity, we have talked about the shape of the hourglass, yeah, that it's like this. No, oh, sorry. Like this. So largest is the in the upper part, six millimeters. The upper part is called epitympanic recess, and in clinics it's called also atticus. Yeah, as the attics is what is on the on the top of old houses, either in Greeks or in Renaissance. For example, the balustrade or other things just be on the top of these old houses was called attics. And that's why it's also called atticus, yeah? It's a clinical term for the epitympanic recess. Then we have to talk about the folds, that there are many folds. Two folds are on a tympanic membrane. Then we have a fold of uh, corda tympani. We have a fold which covers the incus and the stapes. And between some of the folds, there can be uh, spaces, such, such pouches, yeah? So there are three of these pouches, they possess an eponymic name, and if they are not well ventilated, they can be a spot where the inflammation starts. So during the operation, when you in, uh, open the cavity, you can see the three bones and uh, tympa, corda tympani covered uh, with the mucosa, and in between are spaces. So if you would like to enter the spaces, the spaces, of course, are named. So the, these are the names of the spaces. As for histology, that's very, I would say, primitive. Low cuboid, simple epithelium, no goblet cells, no glands, only towards the pharyngeal opening of the auditory tube, they start to appear, first the goblet cells, and then, and then a very, very small glands. Yeah. Okay, this is the opposite view. That means, uh, from lateral to medial, and you can see the mastoid antrum with the prominence of facial canal and a prominence of lateral semicircular canal and the pyramidal eminence here and a promontory here and a round window here. Tendon of tensor tympani muscle cut, tendon of stapedius here. This is great petrosal nerve, and this is geniculum of facial canal. And this is the end of facial canal, so this is still a mastoid foramen. What is missing here would be internal jugular vein and its bulb. So what can happen here, the wall, if there's a dehiscence or the wall is membranous, you can, you can see the bulb of the internal jugular vein, you can see the wall of the anterior carotid artery, you can see the wall, uh, you can see the uh, perineurium and epineurium of uh, facial nerve, and you can see the outer wall of lateral semicircular canal. So these are the four major structures which can be harmed during inflammation or surgery of the middle-ear cavity. Yes? Okay. Uh, we have talked about the mastoid antrum and cells. Here, uh, information about the development. They develop postnatally as the mastoid process develops by traction of sternocleidomastoid muscle. Yeah, after birth. That's why they develop later. Yeah? And uh, the histology for them, the epithelium is really squamous, so it's, it's a simple squamous epithelium. And very important clinical information is that here dorsally is very thin wall between sigmoid sinus. So if there's a chronic inflammation in the ear cavity, it can spread into the mastoid process air cells. So then we have a mastoiditis, and there's a danger that it can go into the sinus and can cause thrombosis of the sinus and another spread into the cranial cavity. So we treat it 
by opening of the uh, mastoid air cells and cutting them away, which we call mastoidectomy. And the last information about uh, the middle ear is the auditory tube. You can see that there are many, many synonyms. Eustachian tube is used mainly. Salpinx is not used much, but salpingitis, you know, is a inflammation of uterine tube. But we have a salpingopharyngeal muscle. Yeah, that's why the term salpinx uh, also exists, even if it's not used much in clinics. Pharyngotympanic or auditory tube. So it has got a tympanic opening and a pharyngeal opening. The pharyngeal opening goes into nasopharynx at the level of inferior nasal meatus. And it's a mirror to the external acoustic meatus. So it has got an osseous part and then cartilaginous part. The cartilaginous part consists of two plates connected with the membrane. Uh, two plates connected with the membrane. I will show you in a figure. Which is visible well here. So we have two plates, one plate and the other plate. And in between is not here visible a membranous layer. Yeah. So that's the cartilaginous part. And uh, do not forget a very important information in nasopharynx, which is called uh, tubal tonsil. Yeah, the tubal tonsil is a small tonsil accumulation of lymphoid tissue below mucosa just at the entrance to, to the auditory tube. In case we have uh, uh, hypertrophy of pharyngeal tonsil it can closer it, it, it can close the pharyngeal opening in children very important information is that the tube is shorter wider horizontal yeah in adults it is oblique longer and more narrow. That means in kids, if they have rhinitis, cold inflammation in the nasal cavity during sleep, it can easily spread into middle cavity and cause mesotitis. And in case the pharyngeal tonsil is enlarged, then it means the inflammation there is chronic and the pharyngeal opening is smaller, so the middle ear cavity is not cleaned properly then the mesotitis can come and we need to perform the removal of pharyngeal tonsil, which is called adenotomy. Yeah, we have talked about that in the lymphoid system already. Okay. So then the function is obvious. It equalizes the pressure uh, in the tympanic cavity with the pressure in pharynx. So if you go uh, with the air playing up and down, you need to swallow and during swallowing uh, the auditory tube opens yeah as for histology it is a bit more interesting as there's a transition and the transition is uh, smooth there is no direct line of the transition so it's not uh, it's not sudden but it's smooth so, uh, from pseudostructified columnar ciliated epithelium into simple columnar and then uh, into middle ear cavity it gets cuboid and low cuboid and it gets flat in uh, air cells. Yeah? There are goblet cells and small tubal glands in the cartilaginous part. So it is open during swallowing by action of two muscles tensor tympani and salpingo pharyngeal muscle yeah which you can you can see in the in the in the figure here and some uh, some function of the levator belly palatini is is also uh, related but we are not much sure about its proper function 
if it helps in opening or in closing. To open and close, you need a, a buffer space around, such a pillow, and this space is filled with connective tissue, loose connective tissue with uh, adipose tissue, so a fat pad, and we call it Ostman's fat pad. Yeah? So maybe on MRIs you can see uh, an area of the fat pad around, which allows the opening of the auditory tube. And if you look at the histology, you can see the pseudostratified epithelium here, yeah, and then the lamina propria, and cartilage with perichondrium. So quite, quite boring histology here. So any questions to the middle ear cavity? You can ask. As for the inner ear, you have a special lecture concerning uh, inner ear, but I would like to make some, some introduction as the inner ear is very complicated. Firstly, uh, the real treatment of inner ear disorders uh, is possible only in two ways. One of them, in the case of bad hearing, you can use the cochlear implants. Yeah? So you put a cochlear implant with the electrodes inside the inner ear and the implant is then put behind the ear. So it's not uh, performed very commonly. And the second option, in case you have some troubles with labyrinthine artery, which supplies the inner ear, to use uh, vasodilation drugs yeah, to dilate the artery and to bring, again, enough, enough blood and oxygen to inner ear. So uh, the treatment of the inner ear problems is, is not quite large. But uh, there are so many structures, so to understand how it works, to understand the physiology, and then the pathophysiology of the disorders, uh, we have to talk about the details for longer time. So we have the bone capsule, which is called osteos labyrinth, and then we have inside the membranous labyrinth. Yeah. So the osteos labyrinth consists of three parts. The bony cochlea, or hearing, yeah. the bony semicircular canals, three of them, for balance, main, mainly for acceleration and deceleration, and the vestibule, which contains then uh, saccule and utricle for horizontal and vertical movement. Yeah. So the membranous labyrinth is then membranous cochlea for hearing, and the vestibular labyrinth for balance and acceleration and deceleration. And there are two kinds of fluid, endolymph, endo, so it's inside the membranous labyrinth, and perilymph, peri, it's outside the membranous labyrinth, so it's between the bony wall and the membranous wall. Yeah? And of course, it's applied by nerves via the internal acoustic meatus. So that's just the general introduction. Here is an interesting view. The inner ear is located here. So you can project it below the lateral half of the, uh, of the eye cleft, yeah? If you look at the projection from above, we can see that it projects uh, onto the anterior surface of uh, petrosal part of temporal bone. And uh, cochlea, the snail, is left turning on the left side and right turning on the right side. Yeah? Then you have the vestibule, and then three canals in three different planes. The opening which goes in are internal acoustic meters, and then here vestibular canaliculus, and somewhere here down, not visible here, will be a cochlear canaliculus. Yeah, so three openings. We come to the openings in a minute as well here. So when we open the bony or the osseous labyrinth, what we can see. 
within the vestibule, which is here, you can see some smaller structures. Elliptic and spheric recess. So something what is round and something what is oval. Uh, so you can see these. Cochlea recess is then this, this opening where the cochlea starts. So you can see the cochlea then here. And how the nerves gets in, it's called macula cribrosa. You know, lamina cribrosa, cribriform plate. Here we have macula cribrosa, yeah? And the macula cribrosa are located in these areas. But I come to a better figure just now. So here I can repeat that. So we have the elliptic recess, which is oval and it's for utricle, yeah? The membranous part, which is called utricle. Then we have the round recess, which we call spheric, that's for saccule. This is a small cochlea recess from which the cochlea starts, yeah? And then we have the cribriform maculae. And we have the superior and middle and inferior through which the nerves then pass in. Yeah. Okay. How many openings do we have in vestibule? So we have openings into semicircular kennels. One, two, three into so called ampullae, which are the larger parts. Yeah. And then we have. Uh, only two openings into so-called cura. So the lateral one, as you can see here, that turns around and op opens here into an opening of cruise. Yeah? So this is so-called cruise simplex. Yeah? That's the opening of the lateral semicircular canal. And as you can see, the anterior and posterior canal this one is anterior, the old name superior, but we call it anterior and posterior. Their crews or their limp joints, so we have a common one. Yeah? So there's another opening, the common one. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Opening of so called. Uh, Vestibular canaliculus, vestibular canaliculus, and I showed you before the vestibular canaliculus, and it contains it contains the uh, endolymphatic duct. I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, of course, into the uh, vestibule you get through the oval window. Yeah, the oval window is not visible here. You get there through the oval window. What we can see is the round window. The round window would be here. But the, but the oval window we have destroyed. Yeah? The oval window we have destroyed to see in. And I'll try to show you the oval window then somewhere. This is a section through the same. So let's go through the details again. Oval window. And we looked in a previous figure this way. That's why we have destroyed the oval window. Yeah, That's why you haven't seen it. So the oval window with the base of stapes. The round window with the secondary tympanic membrane. Okay, so this is vestibule. Yeah, and in the vestibule we have some recesses. Elliptic recess in the utricle. Oh, I just draw the recesses. The spheric recess with the saccule, and the cochlear recess with the beginning of the cochlea. Yeah. So then, this is the utricle, this is the secule, and the cochlea, and inside the cochlea, this is the membranous cochlea, yeah? membranous cochlea. The membranous cochlea is also called, and I can write it here, yeah? uh, membranous cochlea, 
it's on the section it's also called scala media as you will see middle staircase or cochlear duct ductus cochlearis as you can see it's a it's a tube it's a blind tube it terminates here yeah Or better here, it terminates here and here. So it has got two blind, two blind ends, and the only communication is another color is here. So how we call these parts? This we call secum, yeah. That's as a, it is a, uh, it is a blind spot. Yes. Okay. I clear it and we can continue. So as this was a utricle and this was a secule, then into the vestibule, as well as into the utricle, there will be several openings. Uh, opening of one ampulla and the other ampulla and the other ampulla. So the three ampulla, three semicircular ducts and kennels. What is a kennel? The kennel is this one. That's the bony structure. And inside the bony structure is a duct, semicircular duct, which is a membrane of structure. Yeah. There is a question: What is helicotrema? Helix, cochlea, in other word, yeah. And trema means an opening. So helicotrema is this opening. And this opening is between this space. And this space is called, with the same color, scala vestibuli. Yeah. So the vestibular staircase, as it goes from vestibule. Yeah, you can see it goes from the vestibule. Then it goes through helicotrema. That was the question. Helicotrema, a small opening in the top in so-called cupula in the top, yeah. And then it continues. I take a, a slightly different color. It continues, oh, it's not a different color. It continues there. We are still in the white space, which is perilympha. Yeah, this is perilymphatic space. And you see it comes to the secondary tympanic membrane to the round window. And this we call scala tympani. You will see all, all these on the section of the cochlea then. Yeah? So two staircases and helicotrema uh, just interconnects them. Okay. Back to here. So we had three ampullae. Of course, the ampullae are uh, both for, for the bony. Kennels and for the uh, membranous ducts. Yeah, so both kennels and ducts has got their ampulla. And then we have the crews. Here you can see the crews simplex of the lateral canaliculus, and here crews commune of the anterior and posterior. So which is which? This is uh, lateral. This one. Yeah, and then we have the uh, posterior and anterior one. The posterior is just located within the bone and we cannot see it. The lateral we can see as the prominence in the middle ear cavity. And the uh, anterior we can see as a, uh, eminencia arcuata, arcuate eminence on the superior uh, anterior aspect of the petrosal bone, if you remember that. 
Okay, which other structures are here? And here we have interconnection yeah, between the cochlea or uh, between the membranous cochlea or the scala media. Yeah, scala media, membranous cochlea or uh, cochlear duct, ductus cochlearis, and the saccule. And we call this ductus reunions. Uh, as it unites something. Something means uh, scala media, cochlear duct with the saccule. Yeah? So the endolympha can flow. What is, what is blue is endolymph. What is white is perilymph. And then another structure, which is called here. And the name of this structure is very easy. It is called ductus utriculo saccularis. Okay. So utricular saccular duct, as it connects these two structures. And then the last visible here is this. As it uh, contains endolymph, it's called ductus endolymphaticus. So, endolymphatic duct. Yeah? And the endolymphatic duct terminates as an endolymphatic sac. What happens there? The endolymph is absorbed into the venous blood. So here you can imagine a different color. You can imagine here some sinuses. Yeah, and usually inferior petrosal sinus is the area where it where it is absorbed. How we call the bony duct, analiculus vestibuli, is the bony canal through which uh, the endolymphatic duct uh, passes. Yeah? And this end is then called external aperture. So apertura externa, which is visible on the posterior surface of the petrosal part of temporal bone. So vestibular canaliculus contains endolymphatic duct and some veins. And we have another structure, which is here. It's the cochlear canaliculus, canaliculus cochlear, which contains as well a vein, and it contains also a perilymphatic communication outside here with the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So now you know all the main structures. So please pose me questions if something is not clear. Yeah, I'll try to repeat that again quickly, just, just marking the main structures. So we have the utricle and secu connected with the utricular saccular uh, utriculosecular duct. Yeah. We have three ampullae of semicircular ducts. These ducts are uh, anterior, posterior, and lateral. The lateral has got its crew simplex, so an individual limb, and anterior posterior has got a crew commune, so a common limb. Yeah. Then we have the scala media, endolymphatic. Above we have scala vestibuli. Down we have scala tympani. It's a perilymphatic space coming uh, connected with the vestibule and via the canaliculus cochlea outside with the cerebral spinal fluid in subarachnoidal space. 
how the endolymph is produced. The endolymph is produced here in stria vascularis and drains this way. Is produced here in maculae and here in maculae and in crista ampullaris and is drained here and absorbed here in the sac. You will talk about about this in, in histology in detail. Yeah? So it's absorbed in, in this endolymphatic sac, sacus endolymphaticus, which is drained by ductus endolymphaticus, and it is part of the canaliculus vestibuli. Round window with the secondary tympanic membrane oval window at the base of the steps. Okay, everything clear? I hope so. Okay, can infection enter a CSF through cochlear canaliculus? Uh, yes, but not very often. Not very often then, but the in infection uh, should be uh, in the inner ear and then the infection of the inner ear then causes problems and it's usually treated well but yes it is it is a root but it's it's very rare yeah? okay then all the other information which is here uh, gives you uh, the histological detail here i would like to show here this is the lateral view of the vestibule and you can see nicely the oval window. Yeah? The round window is below and it's covered with the secondary tympanic membrane. And we, when we cut these, then we get into vestibule and see what we have seen before. There is a question, what does this connection do? You mean the perilymphatic duct here? Oh, sorry, the uh, canaliculus cochlea. The canaliculus cochlea contains a vein and contains a paralymphatic communication between paralymph and CSF, which has a very, very similar composition. Why is it possible to die or pass out if you get a hit to your ear? Uh, well, it's not uh, so easy if you get to the ear, what then happens? But uh, the hit to the ear can destroy uh, the brainstem, if it's too big, it can destroy, it can cause a skull base a fracture and a leakage of cerebral spinal fluid, for example. Yeah, so that can be the answer to your question, which is, which is a bit queer to me. But definitely, if you get a hit to the ear, uh, you can have a rupture of the tympanic membrane, which is the most common, uh, most common problem. And it's usually a sign of, of, uh, of uh, home violence, yeah, like men to, to women. Okay, this is histology and the function, so I can skip all these. And uh, now let's stop a bit uh, the cochlea. Now you can see a bony cochlea. Well, if you can understand this figure, this is internal acoustic meters. And you may remember the internal acoustic meters look like that. Yeah, we have drawn it. And ventrally dorsally. And this is facial area for the facial nerve. And this is cochlear area. And this is the cochlear area here. And the arrangement in the cochlear area of the nerve fibers is like a spiral, yeah? And the spiral is here, and the spiral is there because it is below uh, the cochlea itself. Yeah? The cochlea is this. It forms two and three quarters uh, of a turn. And we have a structure which is called modulus. It's this one. Modulus is a is a cone, yeah, a cone. And this modulus, it's it's a core of of the cochlea. From the modulus, we have the spiral lamina. Spiral lamina is this. Osseospiral lamina. And if we add to the osseospiral lamina another two fibrous lamina then you can see that we have divided it into three spaces. Scala vestibuli upper, scala tympani lower, 
containing per lymph and scala media or cochlear ducts that's the membranous cochlea containing endolymph yeah i'll show you this again on a histological slide well why are here the kennels as here are the hair cells and the nerve fibers go this way this way down and here or a better color this way here down and here and in here it's a here's a nerve cell body yeah pericarion and if you take all the pericaria they make a spiral that's why the ganglion is called ganglion cochleare but it used to be called spiral ganglion ganglion spirale yeah as it's located like that cupola is the top but basis is is down yeah so this is the base basis the cupola is the top and helicotrema between the scala vestibular scala tympani would be located in this area but not not visible in this section so what is modiolus you know the modulus of the anguli oris it's just the shape yeah modiolus means uh, a spindle so this is like a spindle shaped or better a cone shaped structure and it has got two kind of canals spiral canal and as i said the spiral canal goes like around there up and the spiral canal contains the bipolar neurons bodies yeah so the pericardia of the bipolar neurons and then we have the longitudinal canal and the longitudinal canal contains axons of all these neurons and they continue as the cochlear nerve yes so this is the bony part here you see the section histological slide and we can see scala vestibuli and scala tympani scala media this is corded organ this is modiolus yeah and uh, if we come here this is end of anatomy and uh, beginning of histology and you can see the three scala scala vestibuli tympani filled with perilymph media with endolymph the cortis organ is well visible here this is the cortis organ this is so-called stria vascularis and the stria vascularis produces endolymph yeah? it's a structure producing endolymph it's a epithelium so by transudation from from the blood and all the other information is histology. So do you have questions to this? Basic anatomy of cochlea? If not, please do not forget that part of uh, all this is vestibular cochlear nerve. So repeat vestibular cochlear nerve, it's examination, auditory pathway as well, vestibular pathway as well yeah and then we come to last information which is a bridge to clinics so we can examine the external ear and tympanic membrane using otoscopy or even a microscope yeah if there's an inflammation and too much uh, pressure and the danger of rupture appears we perform a puncture called paracentesis if it's chronic, you can put into this punctured hole a metal metal tube or tubule, yeah, which is called grommet. And we leave it there for several weeks or months just to drain it and to clean it. Okay, what is a tuning for you know for you know it's used to uh, examine the quality of the hearing, yeah, the tuning fork. Vestibulo-ocular reflex. Of course, if you move the head, you need to move the eyes. Yeah? So the information from the vestibular system goes to uh, media longitudinal fascicle and then to uh, the muscles of the eyes and the muscles of the head and neck yeah? to coordinate these. If it's not well coordinated, then the 
nystagmus can appear. Audiometry is a method for subjective uh, examination of the quality of the hearing. You are in a, in a specific uh, box, you listen to different frequencies and you just press a button saying I hear, I can hear and what is the quality. Yeah? It just tells you about the subjective perception of hearing. But to make it a bit uh, objective, we use brain evoked response or brain evoked response auditory. So you again send some information, uh, you, you send some uh, sounds into the ear of the patient, but the patient has an electroencephalography above the brain stem. So we can see if the problem is in the auditory pathway, which passes through brain stem, mainly pons, yeah, through the lateral lemniscus. Every uh, antenna or every, every this uh, transmission machine works not only as an acceptor, but also as a sender. So we have autoacoustic emission. So if you send a wave into the ear, the ear will pro uh, itself will uh, produce uh, specific waves, which are not, uh, which we cannot hear, but they can be detected by, by some uh, devices, yeah, which we call autoacoustic emission. And they are produced by outer hair cells. So this also can be, can be used. So this is for uh, examination. We can use special X-ray projections for, uh, yeah, I'll go back. They have names. It is not necessary to know the names. Then verse and shoulders projections. And they can show you some specific structures like external, internal acoustic meters and mastoid process. So the shoulders one shows you the mastoid process here well. And you can see the pneumatization of the mastoid process. This is the temporal mandibular joint. So you can see CT, MRI, but for some structures, the X-rays are still used. Or on this inverse projection, you can nicely see uh, the internal acoustic meters. If, and if, for example, a neurinoma is inside or not, and the neurinoma then causing problems with the bone already. Yeah. So there are some specific projections used only in uh, ENT. And finally, some terms which you can use. Otalgia, Latin term for ear pain. Vertigo, I hope you know it's uh, uh, if you feel dizzy. Tinnitus is uh, any buzzing or ringing or other uh, annoying uh, sounds which appear uh, constantly and without an external cause. Yeah, so that's tinnitus. What is nystagmus we know? The motions of the eyes, of both eyes, so they are uh, versions. And these versions are not controlled by your mind, so they are quite quick. They are rhythmic. Yeah? We have either we are deaf, it's called surditas. If there's any French, it's easy for him or her to understand. Hypacusis, that you do not hear well. And hyperacusis, you may remember that from the facial nerve policy. Hyperacusis is a painful hearing in a peripheral policy of the facial nerve. Very common disease of inner ear is called Meniere's disease. And the ions, this balance is there, cause vertigo and tinnitus. Yeah? Of course, atherosclerosis of, of labyrinthine artery can cause problems. And as I said, the most frequent cause of acquired deafness in adulthood was otosclerosis. In kids, it's meningitis. Yeah? So a severe meningitis can cause uh, even a loss of, loss of hearing. There's a question. By which structures is tinnitus caused? Uh, of course, tinnitus is the problems in, in, in buzzing uh, and ringing in ears. So it's the problems of, of hair cells. Yeah? And uh, the hair cells can be irritated by different causes. One of them can be ion disbalances. Yeah? 
So uh, it it originates already in in the uh, spiral cortis organ and then in in the nervous system. Not at all. So that's all. Do not forget that we will test, uh, of course, not only anatomy but also histology and embryology. And the histology of inner and embryology will be uh, presented by Dr. Rolik soon. So, do you have any question about the senses? I can answer it. Otherwise, I will stop uh, recording and thank you for the attention.